here we go. So this is um, what today's session is about, um, based really on my own personal and professional experience and area of expertise I've developed down the years through a trigger um, for me um, in terms of rejecting or rather sidestepping a label that could have been placed on me. I'm suggesting that we start uh, with an opening round because nobody has arrived until they've spoken. And the question I'm going to ask you in an opening round is what does your brain do best and why is that important? So while you're thinking about that, um, I will just stop sharing briefly so that the screen is a little less cluttered. And what I'm going to ask you to do is um, participate in a single round where the order of the, the circle, if you like, the metaphorical circle, is that I will go first and respond to the question, followed by Alicia, Mary will follow Alicia, Peter will follow Mary, and I'm aware that your response will be in the chat, Peter, that's absolutely fine. Susan, if you would follow Peter, please. Um, Marie, if you would follow Susan, and Yaya, if you would be last but absolutely not least. So um, the idea is that in a thinking environment round, you can talk for as long as you want. Obviously, we just have a limited time in the webinar, so I implore you to be succinct, and I will try to be succinct also. And there's no interruptions. We just try and give one another the best attention so that the thinker does their best thinking. And when I ask you to introduce yourself, as well as answer the question, first name is fine. If you want to say something about your work, that's fine, but it's not necessary. We're here as equal thinkers rather than um, representing roles. So the question is the really important thing. So the, in answer to the question, what does your brain do best and why is that important? Um, I think my brain is pretty good at remembering people's names. I work really hard on that. I've developed really strong sort of neural capabilities around that. And the reason why that's important is as an educator, what I'm interested in doing is making a very sincere and quick connection with individuals so that they can be present as themselves. And the name really is the proxy for the human. So it's about connection for me. So Alicia, if I could ask you, what does your brain do best and, um, and why is that important? And don't forget to unmute yourself. Oh, I'm muted. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Thank um, you. <laughs> it, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, I feel that my brain responds, or, or, or what it does best is responds to people really quite well. And it likes to be, uh, it likes to be challenged and to do things spontaneously. Um, if, I, if I hem myself in too much, uh, then things become a bit too staged. So I like a lot of freedom, but um, in, in one of my roles as a tutor, I have to re really kind of be pinned down and that's quite oppressive. Um, but I just use the free thinking side of myself to get out of that as soon as I can. <laughs> um, and why is it important? Um, because only when I'm in that space can I create uh, only when I'm in that space can I innovate and only when I'm in that space can I achieve true, true connection and for me that is pivotal in everything that I do is true connection. Thanks Alicia. Um, in the way of things, uh, the Zoom little, uh, uh, what do you call it, celebrity squares boxes have mixed themselves all up again. Did I say Mary next? Is there anything you want to type for us in response to um, that question? It's fine to pass if you wish as well. It's okay, Mary, that's really fine. We'll move on if that's okay. But just give us a quick yes. I'm guessing you can hear us okay, yeah? That's fabulous. Thank you very much. 
Peter, if I could move on to you, um, do you wish to respond to the question? Again, it's fine to pass if the typing is a pain, but we would love to hear from you. What does your brain do best and why is that important? <laughs> Peter, I don't know if you can see that. It says his typing ain't brilliant. Sounds pretty good to me. Problem solving. Yeah. And why is that important? Lateral thinking. Great. Great stuff. Yes, your role is managing people. Absolutely. Peter says it's a big help and it certainly is. Thank you. Thanks for your contribution, Peter. Susan, could I move to you? Yes, yet yeah, now we can certainly see you. So what does your brain do best and why is that important? And welcome. Thank you. Um, okay, so can we, can we uh, cut the Susan and call me Sue? Is that all right? Yeah, I would love to. <laughs> okay, that's good. Um, so uh, what does my brain do best? I think that um, having had a minute to think about it, because you, Lou, had had lots of time to think about it, um, I've decided that it's probably about um, thinking how to make people comfortable when they're, they're with me or when they meet me. And that's really about getting the most out of the real person the person that's that's really sat there or really walking towards you simple but that's it so to start off with then uh, a few definitions couple of definitions just so we're but we're all absolutely clear um where we're coming from with this because there are many different definitions out there um around the word neurodiversity it's quite a contested concept at the minute and i don't mean in the sense of anybody's particularly contesting um, you know, an essential, um, very basic definition of it, what is being contested is um, who owns it, um, which is quite interesting when we come to explore what the concept is. So I'll return to that later. Neuro in the sense of neurodiversity, just how the brain is wired up. I'm using a metaphor there that is just simple to grasp and understand, the brain's wiring. And then diversity, I've uncoupled that from the concept of equality that we tend to mash it up with quite often. I'm using a definition of diversity that's around all identities being present and welcome. As human beings, we each own, identify with many different identities, some of which are protected characteristics under the Equalities Act and some of which aren't. So I have a really powerful identity as an adopted person, as a single parent, um, probably more powerful than I have an identity as a, as a white person because coming to terms with understanding my own whiteness is really a work in progress for me, even at 51. So diversity is present when the individuals present all feel, each feel that they can be present absolutely as themselves without having to deny any aspect of their identity. Put together, neurodiversity refers to the way in which the brain is wired in so many different ways according to the individual. And the word itself has, has echoes of the concept of biodiversity. I think most people grasp that biodiversity in terms of many different grasses, many different animals, many different bees, butterfly, birds, ecological diversity is essential to the future of this earth. One species of anything would soon be absolutely um, uh, out of existence um, without the, the biodiversity, which is part of the earth's richness and which is absolutely um, essential to be able to continue maintaining the circle of life. And the same is true. The metaphor holds absolutely true for neurodiversity. We are all wired differently. And what neurodiversity is, is an affirmative approach to challenge what we have now. What we have now is a deficit model where there is a sense of what is normal, what is mentally and emotionally normal 
and those of us, most of us, who do not sit in that normal box neatly all the time or any of the time are, you know, outside of that. We are less normal, at worst abnormal, um, but we are different, we are othered, we are outside. Where does all of this come from? Where does this concept of normal come from? Well, it comes back from the 1700s, which in some senses are a really long time ago. In other senses, it's 400 years ago, and that's nothing in the history of the world. 400 years ago, in Western Europe, a group of men, writers, thinkers, philosophers, founded a, a, a loose movement, which is now known as the Enlightenment. And during the Enlightenment, this figure here, this Leonardo da Vinci, Vitruvian man figure, came to be how human was defined. This is the uber-human, this is the perfect human, the David Beckham figure, yeah, of his age. Absolutely buff, you know, this is someone who is clearly male, I've chopped that bit off, but I'll give you my word, he's clearly male, clearly white, uh, clearly uh, privileged, uh, economically privileged, because you don't get those muscles living in poverty in the, the 1400s when uh, Da Vinci was drawing this. You would maybe take a guess at real physical health. He's not only got all his limbs, he's got extra limbs, but you know, you take my point. There is an assumption there, I'm sure, around heterosexuality, though Leonardo da Vinci, of course, you know, that's, that's much less certain. An assumption around um, a level of not only intelligence, but a level of capacity to think, capacity to reason, um, and, you know, mental steadiness, I guess, in the sense of, um, not being, uh, being able to function in the world. The idea of the Enlightenment was that everyone could aspire to be this Vitruvian man through education. The Enlightenment was all about education. And that's okay up to a point. But if you're absolutely in poverty and you're grafting all day and you've no time to think, you can't aspire. Yeah, if you can't eat to get those muscles to, to work out, you can't aspire. If you're female, you can't aspire. If your skin is not this beautiful Western European whiteness, you cannot aspire. And so what has come to be internalized across the whole human race as perfectly human was actually, you know, established 400 years ago. And what happens is that all of us who cannot aspire to be that through gender, through race, through uh, mental health and wellness through economic situation in every sense is othered from that perfect human. That's how I want it to land with you. That sense of othering as the opposite of equality. Fundamentally, if this is most human, we are all least human. And that's where the concept of neurodiversity lands as well. If the epitome of human is this sort of functioning, normality or those of us who struggle at any time we're on the outside of that so this is what neurodiversity is neurodiversity says hang on a minute what is this deficit model is normality is that really just about fitting in is that about society not being geared to us rather than us not being geared to society is society only constructed on an enlightenment model where the normality that uber human is the person who fits in. That is a strong argument. Neurodiversity is defined as being the normal variation of the human brain, an authentic form of human diversity. So not something which is less than, not something which is deficit, not something which is, needs remedial work to bring it up to speed, okay? And it's a civil rights campaign. It is also a civil rights campaign, led very much by um, the uh, autism civil rights movement, but not only that, and this is where the tension comes in. This is where the irony is, in that, you know, placing labels on ourselves in order to campaign from a point of identity is almost anti-neurodiversity, but the campaign's got to come from somewhere, and there are people out there doing really tremendous work. So what can we do as educators, as organisers, commissioners, managers of education, as people working in a variety of roles? 
as educators in order to bring a neurodiversity approach to an organization, these are the things that we can do. We can reject deficit labels. So don't hang that, you know, round the neck of the person as soon as they come through the door. We can work with individuals and we can intentionally practice values. That's what the neurodiversity educator does. And these things are not rocket science. We found um, through our work as the mental health and further education crowd, we found that what works for a neurodiverse education system are the very basic principles that have worked for us down the years in community learning. What works is when we recognize and welcome the individual into the learning group by getting to know them in all of their neurodiversity, in all of their identities. What works is having a mechanism through information, advice and guidance to do that, which is really integrated. And not immediately to behave as though there's a remedial job of work to be done. Neurodiversity, remember, is about equality. If we think students are less than us, or other colleagues are less than us, perhaps their only learning support, perhaps they're only a volunteer, then it's never going to be a neurodiversity platform because that equality is missing. If we think that someone who has dyslexia needs bringing up to speed, if we're thinking in those terms, then that's not equality either. That's not neurodiversity. So why don't we talk with the person who has dyslexia, the person who has ADHD, and find out what they are brilliant at? What, how can we bring into the classroom and draw on the creativity of the ADHD person? How can we draw on the organizational skills and strategies of someone who has managed their dyslexia from, you know, the year dot, from becoming literate? How can we work with the forensic attention to detail of the student with Asperger's or the colleague with Asperger's? How can we shift things round so that the student with depression who struggles to get going in the morning comes in and has a little bit of ease, a cup of tea, a bit of a social um, situation before the class starts. This is about reconfiguring our service so that at the point of contact at the, in the classroom or wherever that classroom is, everybody can come along and be present as themselves without having a remedial label attached to them. Look at the whole world of diversity. You would not put a remedial label on a person of color just because they were black. So why would you put a remedial label on a person with dyslexia because they have a certain way in which their brain is wired? There's an old saying in community development, we used to talk about hard to reach people. And the affirmative shift was when we started to talk about hard to reach services. Why is our education service hard to reach for some people who are not neurotypical, who are not wired up to the norm? Why are we not exploiting all of their glory? And to do this, the thing that we most need in our armory is the notion of empathy as a political act. Not empathy in the sense of, oh, I'm so sorry you've got, you know, Asperger's, but empathy in the sense of, Okay, so how is it? How is it to live with this way of wiring? How is it to live with being wired up in this way? And what can we do to work together to make this course, this organization, this setting really work for you? Working with the individual as the expert of their own wiring. And there is this campaigning element as well, because as educators, we have a sphere of influence, don't we? And um, we're not going to be able to exceed beyond the boundaries of that, about, of that without getting a campaigning head on. So where and how to campaign? In my work, I am trying to campaign for holistic definitions of neurodiversity to absolutely respect, admire and learn from those labeled organizations uh, who are leading the field really in this campaign but not to be drawn into that. The label that could be attached to me 
is ADHD. I don't want to be part of just ADHD people campaigning for neurodiversity because I'll never get over that essential paradox. I'm campaigning as a human being and I'm campaigning through practitioner-led networks such as UKFE chat um, who run regular Twitter chats on a Thursday at nine o'clock. I'm campaigning through my Twitter account. I'm campaigning through Tutor Voices. I'm campaigning through my, my union. And through webinars like this, trying to influence policy via speaking, research, writing, to bring neurodiversity um, as, as an affirmative agenda into policymakers' thinking. That's where I wanted to leave it and hand it over to you. But if you want to find out more, and these slides will be made available to you, um, you might want to read my personal story on my blog, just up here. You might want to have a look at uh, the uh, Power of Autism's campaign, Neurodiversity campaign, a personal perspective, a movement which is online. It's fabulous really in terms of how it sets out um, the uh, discourses around neurodiversity at the moment. If you want to get a book in your hands, there's a wonderful book called The Power of Neurodiversity by a guy called Thomas Armstrong who writes loads on this. What he does in that book is he takes uh, an aspect of neurodiversity for each chapter and he talks about why it is brilliant to, to have this wiring, why it is brilliant to have depression wiring, ADHD wiring, bipolar wiring. It's really a refreshing and world-changing read. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to stop sharing. It's a little disconcerting not to be sort of able to see you and, and physically in the room. And I'm going to ask you what your questions are, please, and, and ask you what you think. We've got um, Katina um, in the chat, Katina Barrett, um, regarding policymakers, uh, Department for Education has a staff neurodiversity network. They have been running internal webinars for staff around this theme. and. Um, Katina has also, that's outside of this uh, webinar and chat, said that there has been quite a lot of interest in those. Um, that's brilliant. Um, yeah, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, I think it, it, there's a sense of a growing movement around neurodiversity, which um, if you look at the academic literature, that's a little bit slower. That's very much um, focused around sort of individual identity camps, if you like. So it is so good that people are starting to talk about this. There is a little bit of a buzz around it. People are getting um, uh, the sense of what it is. The next challenge, I think, is how do we all speak together? You know, where is the massive neurodiversity conference that needs to happen? Or um, the regular neurodiversity Twitter chat? You know, any ideas that can come from today's webinar about how to take this forward and find one another as a neurodiversity network would be absolutely brilliant. Thanks, Lou. I see Alicia, um, you've asked a question as well. And Alicia's question is, you mentioned that there was a tension between who owns the title neurodiversity. Will the medical model influence how this develops? I think that's, that's uh, certainly a danger that, that some people are more organized than others, some people have more privilege um, in terms of influence, some groups have more self-belief perhaps. Um, so this is why, uh, you know, actually collecting together in some form, I think is really important to be able to work around all of this. Nobody can own a word, they can only own um, how they have defined and published their definition of the word. I think the thing that most concerns me and that I want to find more out about is what are the theoreticians you know wh where's that coming from where is the theory emerging um, in terms of a holistic view of neurodiversity I keep looking and not finding stuff and that goes back then to who is funding neurodiversity research papers will only come when papers are funded so you know who can we influence to fund that um, so there's a lot of questions around that, but where there is a power differential, there's always dominance, isn't there? But we can be chirpy and chipper, and I think uh, the affordances of social media now and of, of opportunities like this webinar 
enable voices to be amplified that would not one time have been heard. Yes, I think um, Lizzie's put a comment in about connecting, conferencing, events. Yeah, definitely. Opportunities, not to... What happens at a conference, I think, um, traditionally, is those people who have most capital in the area uh, dominate. You know, the keynote is, it, it has to be a, a person of eminence, da 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 I think to be able to, what I would love to see is an event which is more about listening, talking, everyone bringing their experiences um, into the room to be able to develop some sort of campaigning, voice and influence strategy by the end of the day. So um, I get, I want to do it, you know, I've not got 50p towards it, but you know, it's a thing that I feel I want to do and I want to find people who can maybe make that possible. Uh, your offer of help will not go unnoticed, Alicia, I'll be shouting. Round then. We opened with a round, let's close with a round, um, and I will um, write the names down this time. So um, I will invite you, Yaya, as you didn't have chance to go first, um, followed by uh, Mary, Peter, it's fine in the chat, Sue, Alicia, Marie, if that's possible, I don't know if she's still with us, let me just scroll along. We haven't got Marie. No, not Marie. Alicia, Katina, and myself. So, Yaya, Mary, Peter, Sue, Alicia, Katina, and myself. And the question is, as we close this um, World Mental Health Day webinar, what's your freshest thinking? My freshest thinking is just how much there is to know and learn every day and to know more about things that you think you already know quite a lot about and how to go on about being inclusive, being collaborative, being consultative in uh, more and different and better ways and, and how I mustn't stop questioning the way that I'm doing things and how I must always be conscious of the unconscious prejudices that are within myself and work in a way that addresses those and doesn't let them out there. That's thank you. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Mary, is this anything that you would like to contribute? Um, what's your freshest thinking? Mary's agreeing that we do need to keep questioning the information or practices that we're using. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Mary. Peter, could I invite you um, to respond to the question? Okay, we'll pass. Oh, oh, sorry. So sorry you missed it. Come back. Watch the recording. Um, you know, get hold of me if you wanna if you wanna talk further, Peter. I'm really glad you came back. Thank you. Thank you. Sue, what do you think? What's your freshest? Right. Well, I'm back. <laughs> Don't quite know what happened to me, but I'm back. Um, I still can't type, but I'll, I need to. It's possibly me. Um, my freshest thinking is that this is something that, that people need to learn and understand much more about. And it's like everything else that um, it, it, it takes years, doesn't it, for things to really surface and start to be understood. And then they become uh, the thing. Um, and what we want is to make this a very real thing where the sounds, it's so big. Um, and it really needs to be understood much, much better than I think it is currently. That's where I'm at. I need to understand it a lot better than I do currently. So this has been great. Thank you, Lou. Oh, you're welcome, Sue. Thanks for coming along. Not at all. Alicia, what's your freshest thinking? Hi. Well, as usually, I'm always a bit tigger. <laughs> I get quite excited by things. And then it sits there in my mind thinking, right, really need to do something, really need to do something. And today, it's made me go, okay, so is there any chance of just having a, a planning day? Let's allocate some tasks, let's make some decisions, and let's do. That's where I'm at. 
Um, well, I'll close then um, and just say thank you to everybody. My freshest thinking is absolutely, it's, it's time to act and pull all this together. My fear is that the neurodiversity carpet will get pulled from under us into, you know, just pulled into one identity group or just pulled into one sort of, you know, powerful space. Um, and uh, uh, Alicia had put something in the chat that I missed until we started the round about, you know, perhaps potentially crowdfunding something. It's possible to publish crowdfunding, it's possible to meet crowdfunding. You know, there's all sorts of ways that we could do a lot with a little, I think. So I'm going to have a think about how that might be and I'll be getting back in touch with people. Thanks ever so much for coming along. I'll leave it to you now, Yaya. Thank you for facilitating us. Thank you very much, Lou, for this, well, inspiring and, um, you know, a kind of webinar that gets the, gets the thinking going. And I think we need it we do need to um revisit um even the things that we know but also be so open to um looking at different ways of thinking and 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 um working and you know in a way what i've said was my freshest thinking as an outcome of this so much appreciated i hope that colleagues have enjoyed it um if not as you know as as much as i then perhaps more than i and that you will let us know what you think and that you will perhaps direct others to view this um if if you think that they would benefit from engaging with this topic and from this uh, perhaps being a way to to do so um thank you very much for turning up i look forward to welcoming you in our other webinars the next one is happening on the 13th now this is uh, other organizations are doing webinars left right and center to mark the world mental health um, day which is great so one of those is remploy they're doing a lot around mental health in a workplace mental health with apprentices so there's a whole program of webinars that you can find on our um, mhfe homepage and join those as well as ours they will be doing one that is specific for us on the 27th around supporting apprentices um, with with um, mental health support there are more as i said at the beginning that we are adding as we progress and hopefully i'll be having a pleasure to welcoming you to those thank you and bye-bye now